Hello folks, and welcome to this Discworld review. This is Toops from Team CGS. I was going to cover the first two games within the series in one video, but decided it would probably be better to create a video for each game. Discworld is a difficult beast to view, because you'll tend to fall into one of two camps. Either you enjoy Terry Pratchett's books and obscure British comedy in general, or you don't, in which case you'll positively detest this game. It's as simple as that, really. If you've heard of Terry Pratchett, then there's hope for you yet, but by and large, it's one of those types that can divide opinions right down the middle. Discworld 1 was released on the PC in 1995, and also on the PlayStation and Sega Saturn consoles. It's a point-and-click adventure game that was created by Perfect 10 and Teeny Weeny Games, published by Psygnosis. I've always viewed Discworld as the British equivalent of Monkey Island, because there was a kind of mythic rivalry between the US and UK developers when it came to point-and-click adventure games, with the UK playing catch-up arguably until the release of Broken Sword. Just before I go on, if you're a fan of the old Monty Python, then you may actually enjoy this, because the main character in both games is voiced by none other than Eric Idle. That's not all, the first game also featured the voices of John Pertwee of the British series Doctor Who, and one of my favourites, Tony the Time Team Robinson. The story begins with news that Ankh Morpork, the oldest city on the Discworld, is being terrorised by a red dragon, a being that most ordinary folk believe in, but which the Wizards of the Unseen University think is totally absurd. Anyway, because Wizards are seen by the general population as traditional Guardians, the Arch-Chancellor decides to send the least reliable and seemingly expendable Rincewind. Rincewind is known as an incompetent wizard, who feels he has a wizard's soul, but instead has a body cut out for running, because he usually runs at the first sign of trouble, rather much like me. Rincewind is also accompanied by his companion, the Luggage, a mobile travel accessory with lots of tiny little legs, who usually carries all of Rincewind's useless junk. Now, if you're new to either the game or the books, you'll very quickly get to know the personality of Rincewind thanks to the dialogue, and there's lots and lots of dialogue in Discworld. Again, these can either be a good thing or a bad thing depending on the player. What's a girl doing in here? I'm not a girl. Why are you... Why are you wearing a dress? Now, the graphics were slated as being extremely poor and jerky. The same could be said about the virtually non-existent animation. From an aesthetic standpoint, it wasn't that much of an issue at first. However, that soon changed once you realised that it became quite difficult to find quest-related objects and items on the screen. Very often, it was almost impossible to see them. And when I say impossible, believe me, they are impossible to find. Take, for instance, the worm at the square, which was quite difficult to spot even if you knew what you were looking for. See it? As you can imagine, this led to countless hours trying to figure out what the hell to do, when in reality, the answer was right there in front of you. You also have to remember that the game was released less than a year before Broken Sword, which by comparison had very clear graphics and fluid animation. There was also instances where the game was unintentionally funny because of the poor animation. I might as well throw in the fact that the initial part of the introduction is one of the strangest and most annoying things I have ever seen or heard. It starts off with a room full of mysterious robed figures chanting Dragon! Dragon! And some of them seem to chant Dragagun! Dragagun! But coupled with the hilariously bad animation, it makes you think, What the hell have I gotten myself into? Which leads me on to the next point, the difficulty. The video gaming press cited the obscure puzzles as a major issue, though it's interesting to point out that half of my friends who enjoy the books also claim that the puzzles were too difficult, yet the other half had no problems. From my personal perspective, I found it fairly straightforward. I think it depends on how mad you are, I guess. Hee <laughs> hee. I did have some problems, namely the L space sections, where Rincewind is sent to an alternate Ankh Morpork that takes place at night time. I ended up literally spending hours trying to work out seemingly impossible puzzles in L space, and then had to endure an annoying cutscene every time I went back to retrieve yet another new item. Yeah, it's that kind of game, I'm afraid. Anyway, it's not all bad news. You do get to meet familiar faces from the Discord universe, including Cut Me Own Throat Dibbler, in this game voiced by Tony Robinson, which I have to admit didn't really suit him. Rob Brydon did a much better impersonation in the sequel, Windle Poons, and even Death himself. Hooray! I should also mention that throughout the story, you'll encounter the librarian, an orangutan, who hates anybody either saying the word monkey or making monkey jokes. Well, this is wonderful. I never knew I could speak monkey. 
You also get to visit the locations within the books, but I never had the sense of being at home there like I would eventually do with the second game. As a massive fan of the books myself, this game by the way is roughly based on the book Guards Guards, I had already constructed a picture in my mind's eye of the various locations, but the locations here for some reason just didn't match. It was, as I said before, a different matter with the sequel, but I'll talk about that in the Discworld 2 review. In terms of gameplay, it's just like any other point and click game really, where you combine items and generally just experiment with what works. Luggage can be a pain sometimes, because either it takes forever to get to your location or just gets in the way. I almost forgot that Rincewind can also carry a few items himself, and so the player has to juggle items at certain points throughout the game, because as you'll no doubt find out, some of the stages are inaccessible to luggage. This adds another limited gameplay twist, though it can be annoying when you suddenly realise Rincewind needs a particular object held by luggage, and that you have to endure yet another terrible animation sequence in order to get back to him. And so it is that we move on to the sound and script. The sound is pretty decent with some nice background melodies, but undoubtedly the stars of the show are the script and the voice acting. John Pertwee is simply amazing, a true great in my eyes reinforced by his contributions here, as are Nigel Planner from the British comedy Young Ones and Kate Robbins. Eric Idle is also brilliant as is Tony Robinson. I know I slated his Dibbler performance earlier, but I do love him, really. The script and the voice acting together just really worked for me, and in my case, worked wonders. Because while I know many players just couldn't tolerate the vast amounts of text and basically skip to the important bits, I just couldn't get enough of it. Some purists, basically those who will never be happy with anything unless it came from Terry Pratchett himself, criticised the script for trying too hard to emulate Pratchett's style. This is because he didn't actually have anything to do with the game itself. But I honestly can't think of anyone doing a better job with the script than what's been done here, short of getting Pratchett to write it himself. So, anyway, how's the wife? Oh, not so bad. How's yours? Oh, doing well, doing well. We thought we might invite you two around for dinner tomorrow night. I've made a chocolate cake, strawberry pudding and duck's foot casserole with leaf mould. Leaf mould? Oh, sorry. Uh, did I say leaf mould? Um, I meant caramel. Anyway, there'll be lashings of everything. You know the wife. She likes to cook. Yeah, but is this a good idea? I thought she was watching her weight. Why should she watch her weight? Well, you know, after last time, when she accidentally ate that camel. Oh, well, she's not overweight. She's just, uh, oh, she's just cuddly. Yeah, cuddly. Very, very cuddly. With humps. So, um, how's your wife then? Did she get that thing off her face? Thing? What thing? Uh, the hairy thing. That's a beauty spot, that is. Oh, oh, I see. A bit long for a beauty spot, isn't it, though? I mean, in area. Look, moustaches are supposed to be a sign of sensuality. What, on women? Listen, are you calling my wife ugly? No. Good. I'd have been ever so cross if you did. I do think that this highlights the difference between writers of traditional novels and video game script writers who have interactivity to consider at every turn, something even Pratchett himself may have realised in not writing the game script. When taking all of this into consideration, the game has done absolutely brilliantly. But before I conclude this review, here in the UK the Sinclair Spectrum was a huge success, and it remains relatively unknown elsewhere. And likewise, there was no false pretense when it came to releasing games that properly represented UK culture and tradition. Games like Matthew Smith's Jet Set Willy, for example. Can you think of another game's box art which shows a guy being sick in front of the toilet? No. These days were sadly over even by the time Discworld 1 was released. However, this game is based on British humour and sensibilities and I really can't think of any other game since the days of Jet Set Willy that was created and marketed with the sole intention that it would remain true to British culture regardless of the pressure to break into the dominant US market. Something even Beneath the Steel Sky and, as mentioned before, Broken Sword ended up doing in the end. I know some of you may object to me bringing up this apparent cultural difference, but there are countless games out there that centre on American culture and American humour, yet very few by comparison that feature British culture and humour. British-themed media has sadly gone the way of the dodo. 
i.e. extinct. Though I've always admired Discworld for being true to what it was, and afraid of what others might think. Kind of reminiscent of the, the glory days of Monty Python in the 1970s and 1980s. Yes, it's based on Terry Pratchett's Discworld novels. However, if it were remade today, it wouldn't even get past the planning stage if it didn't appease the larger American audience in some way or other. In conclusion then, while Discworld may not be to everyone's liking, you should at least give it a try. It remains functional as an adventure game, though it suffers from technical design as well as artistic shortcomings. It does, however, make up for these with its amazing script and voice acting. These two aspects are what, in my view, save the game. That and the Pratchett sense of humour which Teeny Weeny Games and Perfect 10 did a respectable job of capturing. My advice would be to read The Colour of Magic before playing the game, that way the humour won't appear too alien to you. It's not a very long book either, but it will help ease you into the game's wacky ethos. You should look upon Discworld as a part of a dying breed of games with Brit-themed humour. Humour that makes it distinct from the legendary Monkey Island series. It's for that reason that I see Discworld as the British equivalent of LucasArts game, which therefore makes it a minority and all the more reason for you to play. And there we have it. I hope you enjoyed that. This is Toops from Team CGS. Until next time, I'll see you later. Goodbye.